Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to our session on uh, building a high growth company using principles from Amazon. Uh, I'm the Ethan, the CEO of Latchel, here with our co founder and COO, Will Gordon. Uh, as you all know, I'm sure at Latchel, we handle 24 7 emergency maintenance coordination for property managers, landlords, and allow you to focus on more important things like growing your business uh, or hanging out with friends and family. Um, that's what these sessions are all about helping you grow your business, diving into industry topics. Um, you know, giving you the uh, need to know um, and sharing some of the models that we found to be successful in our own growth as a business. Today, focusing on those things we've pulled from Amazon that allowed Amazon to be a high growth company and um, that are making Latchel a high growth company too. Uh, yeah. And for a little bit of background on Latchel, it all started about three years ago. I was working at Amazon. My family needed help running their own uh, our own personal family portfolio. And when I stepped in to help out, very quickly realized how big of a headache and how time consuming maintenance coordination could be. That's when I called up Ethan and we teamed up with our other co-founder, Julian, to start building a solution. And now we handle maintenance for nearly 40,000 units across the US. And the way we got to 41,000 units across the US in such a short period of time is exactly what we're gonna talk about today. Oh, we're at 41 um, now. Nice. We're at 41 now. Yeah. So let, let's, let me tell a story actually first to kick us off. Um, this is a story about when Will first started having these like maintenance issues with the property management company that came down from his grandfather. Um, Will leaves this part out sometimes in the introduction, but his grandfather had turned 92 and at 92 decided, or was it 93? It's 92. 92. 92. And 92 decides, uh, you know, I'm gonna, it's time for me to retire. So <laughs> had a long working career in property management. Um, but uh, yeah, so Will was dealing with all these maintenance issues, um, you know, kind of contacted me, got involved, realized this was like a common problem among property management um, companies everywhere. But what Will came to me when he had kind of decided we're going to start a company to solve this problem before we even knew exactly what our solution or product we were going to build was going to be. He came to me with a set of leadership principles, many of which were pulled from Amazon. And so, well, maybe you can actually talk about why that was one of the first things you did in starting Latchel. Why did you start with leadership principles? A lot of it had to do with my time at Amazon. Like, I, I know there's a lot of controversy about the the culture at Amazon, but personally, I, I absolutely loved the the Amazon working culture. I love how we communicated, how we operated, and uh, over time, while there, I realized a lot of Amazon's actual competitive advantage was their culture, which is heavily derived from their leadership principles. Uh, it was a everyday part of the language at Amazon. People would reference the leadership principles and giving feedback and, and how they made decisions, why they're making decisions. It was also something that the company took incredibly seriously. There was a, a team of people looking at how to you know, categorize the leadership principles and help uh, inform hiring decisions even better as the company scaled and grew. I, I was a, um, just before I left, I became an Amazon bar raiser and done hundreds of interviews. And that was also like very deep and impactful for me in making the leadership principles a core part of a company's being as a, a company's core. Uh, can, competitive can you, act, you said you were a bar raiser at Amazon. Can you explain a little bit more about what that is, what that means? Yeah, Amazon has this bar raiser program to ensure everyone coming in to the company meets the hiring bar. Now, I'm sure everyone who's ever hired somebody knows how painful it can be when you have a need and you have this empty seat that you need to fill and basically you're doing the work if if you don't have somebody else doing it and you just want to get that filled as quickly as possible. It's very easy to you know, compromise on your, your principles or your values in order just to you know, alleviate that burning pain. 
So the Bar Razor program was designed to uh, combat that. It would be a third party, someone who's not in the department, not actually feeling that burning pain. It's also very experienced with interviews. Like um, I did well over 100 interviews in a year um, in my final year at Amazon. And a lot of it was part of this, this Bar Razor program. And you basically are sitting in to make sure, does this person meet the Amazon leadership principles overall? If the department that they're joining uh, disappeared or had to be changed, are they adaptable and flexible enough to move somewhere completely different? And also uh, why it's called bar raising is to make sure that they meet a very specific technical bar, um, meaning is anybody currently performing that job? Stack rank them and figure out where is that 50% mark and you want every single person coming into the company to be as good, if not better than at least 50% of the people already doing that, that job in that company. And mathematically over time, if everyone is always 50, better than at least 50%, that bar raises and gets harder and harder and harder. A lot of people who are very tenured at Amazon would say like, I wouldn't meet the hiring bar today if I applied again, just because <laughs> the, the quality of candidates has moved up so much. I think that makes a lot of sense. Like once you're at a certain size, right? So for Amazon, the way they can kind of continue improving their team, their hiring, their, their culture is benchmarking you hire the person that's you know better than the other 50 percent and that bar raises i think it's a little bit harder you know for smaller companies um startups too that's lateral included uh you know when we started out it's not like we had anyone to like measure the bar against um i think a lot of our customers too they're not quite at the size where they have you know, 20 property managers and they're hiring their next and can say, okay, are you better than at yeah. least 10? So how do you handle that as a small that, that, company, as a startup? That's where the leadership principles come in. And that's why I, you know, I, I approached you. I started with just this set of leadership principles. You have certain behaviors and characteristics that you want people to, to exhibit and have. And as long as they're meeting a sufficient number of those, you should bring them into the company. Um, I, as soon as you have like two or three people though in a particular role, that is a time that you should be thinking about, are they better than at least, you know, are they, are they matching or at least better than the, the bottom two people? Um, that way you can still get better over time. Yeah, you know what I hear a lot and uh, I'm trying to balance, you know, is the person you're bringing in 50% better than the rest versus the conventional wisdom, which is hire people that are better than you, which is almost always like impossible, especially when you're starting out and you know exactly how something's supposed to work, you know exactly what you want to happen and you need, you need it to happen exactly that way. How do you like weight those two things? Like, sure, you have, you, you meet these leadership principles, but like you need to be me be be or be better than me. You know what I mean? So that's where I would caution somebody. It's like, you have to think about what your goals are specifically for your business. Do you want to remain a you know, boutique, high service, high touch, more con consultative, or do you want a high growth business? And I, I, it is a, um, I think it's a cop out to say you can't have both. I mean, you certainly can, but if you're going to have both and you need somebody who's better than you at every single thing you do, then they're going to have to be highly compensated. It's really hard to get somebody who's much better than you and also incredibly cost effective for whatever that role is. So you need to think about specific positions, specific skill sets, like, and look at people who are better at you at that specific skill set and maybe not better than you at every single thing that you do. Uh, there are people that are much better than I am at like staying focused on a particular set of tasks and knocking those out. Like I, I'm much more of a systematic type person. So I'm not very well suited for like very um, specific linear uh, a progression and completion of tasks. Other people are absolutely phenomenal at it. So I'm looking for that. I'm looking for people better at me at that. But I don't want somebody who's better at me, better than me at that uh, specific task completion, and also better that, than me at systematic thinking, and also better at me at the strategic thinking for the business, and right. also better at, yeah, it gets, it gets too hard to hire people that way. I think one of the interesting things, when, when we talk about business scalability, right, if you're building something that's high growth, you're adding, you know, you're doubling maybe your unit count every few months. When you're growing at that type of speed, 
Um, and even if you're not growing that fast, even if you're, you're following a slower growth, but your intention is to be bigger, you need to have people on the team that can grow with your company. Right. And we kind of get to talking about, well, is the way you're bringing in people is your team itself scalable. I look at the leadership principles and you almost, those kind of become like the lens that everyone on the team needs to look at everything with in order to think like you, not maybe do exactly what you would do, but to think like you think. The, The best description I've heard of Amazon is it's the company is designed to be scaffolding around Jeff Bezos's brain. And I really liked that, that description and the leadership principles are really helpful for thinking of it that way. You pro- we provided this set of leadership principles for ways to think about problems. And when you're applying a solution on the fly, you use those leadership principles as guidance. So that way, everyone on the team can make decisions on their own without having to consult me or Ethan or even their manager. And they, they, you're allowed to move much faster. Part of being a high growth, high scalability business is you, you can't be involved in every single decision. And if you want to be involved in every single decision, then you're going to be slowing down your company's growth. You're going to be slowing down the ability for your company to get the, to the scale that you want. So you have to provide a framework for people to, to be able to make decisions on their own and let go of that responsibility to let other people make those decisions. So when we look at Amazon and Amazon's growth trajectory, I mean, Amazon's been around like a long time, right? So things probably looked different like year one, two, three than they do now. But can you talk about the things that have remained core to the way Amazon has developed and has allowed this just rapid continued growth, even like at the scale they're at now? And what were the common things 10 years ago and what they're doing now, or even like 20 years ago and what they're doing now? Yeah. A, a lot of a lot of that is codified in the leadership principles. So Amazon has a long list, just like Latchel has a long list of leadership principles. Uh, it does take a bit of effort, though, to think about which ones are the absolute must-haves for somebody coming into the company, and which ones are the things that will grow and develop and get better. And those things that have remained the same and have been unchanging throughout the time are all those must-haves. For Amazon, it was customer obsession. It is customer obsession. So they're always an incredibly customer obsessed company. Their mission statement is to become Earth's most customer centric company. So that's everything they do is driving towards making it a better experience for any one of their customers. They also like to... uh, to Actually, let me stop you for a second because I think that's really interesting. So I actually didn't know that about Amazon. You said their mission is to be the most customer centric company in the world. Earth's most customer centric. Earth, Earth. So so not Mars. Once we colonize Mars, like don't care about that. But okay, cool. So I think the interesting thing is like if you if you ask me, oh, guess what Amazon's mission is? I would say like to offer everything online as cheap as possible. But that's yeah, that's not it. It, 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 They're not trying to just simply offer everything online. No, they just want to be customer obsessed and be the the best in the world at being uh, customer centric and customer obsessed. Yeah, it just so happens that the way they do it is by selling things online. Yeah, but they well, they do a lot more now. Yeah, right? now they, yeah. <laughs> Before but, they went, they just sold books. Now they sell everything and also offer web services and servers and shipping services and. Uh, online video yeah it's it it's if they had narrowed that focus to just sell books online it would be that they, they would have stopped growing a long time ago and the, the only way you're going to continue to grow like that is to you know stretch beyond your comfort zone um but yeah a, a lot of that has to do with the other leadership principles that like really help them grow it's think big um and having a bias for action is, uh, are other things that are huge and driving for them. Uh, Amazon, one of the things that we talked about a lot is a willingness to be misunderstood for a long time, uh, misunderstood by your customers, by shareholders, uh, by, the, by the markets and a- analysts. Like 
you have to have the bravery and the boldness to make bets that may not make sense in the short term, but over the long run will pay off and improve, provide very, very large dividends. Can you explain what you mean about like being misunderstood? Like, is there a specific example you have in mind where people didn't get it, but it made sense for Amazon? Yeah. Well, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of situations like that. So one of the more famous examples is when Amazon first introduced reviews online. And when that first happened, uh, a lot of book publishers were like, what, do you not understand how to sell books? Why would you put these reviews that are public? Do you not want to sell these books? But Amazon understood that that's more customer centric, more customer obsessed. You let people get as much information as they can in order to make that buying decision. Uh, another thing is even Amazon's last mile, which I was a big part of, uh, you can go back years uh, to Amazon's uh, basically articles written about Amazon. They're criticizing Amazon for even trying to attempt it. It doesn't make sense. You know, UPS and FedEx are so huge. U.S. Postal Service is so great. Why would you even try to compete? And Amazon's still working towards it. Uh, grocery delivery is another example. They've been doing it for a long time haven't been successful yet in you know, coming up with a very, very scalable, successful model, but they're willing to lose money on it for a long time to try to uh, get that right solution because eventually it will pay off. Sure. I mean, for Amazon, you know, they can afford to lose lots of money until they figure it out. For most businesses, uh, you know, you need to probably be, be a little more cautious with how you spend, but I want to come back to customer obsession because it sounds like that was sort of primary must have for Amazon and things kind of developed around that being customer obsessed, that being the main leadership principle. It's actually one of our, it's our core leadership principle as well, be customer obsessed. And I think the property management industry is really interesting because in a way, well, like for Latchel, for example, we have multiple different customers, sometimes with varying interests. So we work with property managers, right? To coordinate maintenance, um, of course, like, you know, if you're a property manager listening in, we know that you want maintenance to be done in the most convenient way possible for you. Um, that's why we make an effort so that uh, for every hundred units you have, we're cutting down the time you spend on maintenance to 15 minutes a day, because we know that's what's going to be convenient and what lets you focus on the things you need to focus on. We know it's important that we're transparent with everything we're doing and that we're affordable. And then when you look at the contractor networks we work with, they actually have their own needs too. And we need to be customer obsessed about their needs. They also want things done conveniently. And that sometimes means scheduling for them, right? So that they don't have to go call the tent and get scheduling done. We're going to provide that for them. And they just click a button. And the tenant too, right? Which sometimes can be uh, misaligned interests with maybe the, the contractor or tradesman we're sending out in the property manager, the tenant wants everything done now. Well, that's not always good for the property manager or even like, you know, a, a vendor that you're sending out. Like if I have to do it now and it's 10 PM, I'm going to pay more money. Way better to have someone on the phone troubleshoot it or like deescalate the problem so it can be taken care of during business hours when things are cheaper, right? So you kind of have these like varying interests, but you have to be customer obsessed to the three. How do you kind of like, how would you talk to a, one of our customers or even like, you know, our team about weighing that customer obsession for property managers? You know, they have tenants that they may, maybe need to think about being customer obsessed with. They have property owners that they're working with investors that they need to be customer obsessed about and they'll have their own contractor network. So what would you say to them about how to weight that customer obsession and how do you actually build a, comp a property management company that's customer obsessed? Yeah. I think the first thing, which is probably one of the most difficult things to do in property management is to align interests as much as possible. Like you want to set up your business so that you as the property manager and the property owner that is your client, you, at minimum, your interests need to absolutely be aligned. 
if if you're making money when they're losing money, like that just breeds animosity, mistrust, and it's probably going to hurt the relationship in the long, long run. But there's also things to align interest for tenants and vendors as well to make sure that everyone's getting that same need fundamentally met. Um, now, being customer obsessed doesn't let, mean letting your customer walk all over you. It doesn't mean you know giving away the farm. Ultimately, in order to be customer obsessed and maintain that customer obsession, you have to be profitable. So if you have a tenant that is not you know, respecting the property, it's over requesting maintenance and just causing a, a headache, it's better for the overall company to let that customer go. Like Amazon was not afraid to fire customers. If there are people who are abusing the return policy, you will be banned from purchasing on Amazon. You will not be allowed to purchase on Amazon. There's no law that says everybody must be able to do business with Amazon. Just like there's no law saying that everybody needs to have to live in your properties. Like you, you're able to screen tenants. You're able to evict tenants when they, when they don't uh, cause or when they're not abiding by the rules or paying rent or whatever else it may be. So I think it's uh, really important to first get that alignment of needs, but also have your very clear standards of like what I will and will not do and be consistent in how you apply that and and have that transparency to show like you know you're not meeting these rules you're not meeting these expectations that are set out in the lease or whatever else it may be and this is what I do with everybody as and now now we're on a, a plan to move, move somebody out yeah it's a good example too with like the property investor that you know turns you into their or they think you're their like personal assistant now on all things related to your, to their property, which you don't want to set that expectation. That's not customer obsessed when you're neglecting, you know, 50 other clients of yours for, for the one that wants all your attention. Um, yeah, exactly. To your point, Will, you need to be willing to fire them if, you know, it's, if they're a drain on your ability to be customer obsessed. Um, I, I always think it's interesting to do analyses on on the time and effort required uh, for a particular customer, a particular account versus the revenue that is coming in from that from that account. And it's very often that there's a huge misalignment. The people that are taking up the very most largest amount of your time usually represent a very small portion of the overall por portfolio. I mean, there's obviously exceptions to that rule, and but if whenever you're finding yourself in that case it is the more customer obsessed thing to do to tie end that relationship. That customer obsession doesn't have to mean on every single individual, you are giving them the best service. Sometimes the best thing to do for the company is to end, end service. No, like at what point are you reading the pattern? And it's not like this one off thing where like, I'm not going to change just for you. Cause that hurts my other customers. When does it become, a pattern that you have to address. So I'm, I'm kind of asking more actually for that. Obviously if all your customers are coming back and they're all saying the same thing, okay, you have your pattern, but in cases where it's not super obvious, like what, what did Amazon do to find these like patterns? What Amazon did is, I guess it's two things is to, to try to separate signal from noise. Like any one off is not, it's not necessarily a pattern, but anytime that there's a problem, you still want to do like a, a deep dive root cause analysis, figure out what happened and what went wrong. And is that what's emblematic of a more systematic issue? Like it, it's very easy to get caught up in symptoms. Like, you know, this, I, I missed this call or I, I didn't uh, uh, approve a particular maintenance yeah, so what, what, correctly. What, so are, what elements in the culture of the company stopped people i think this is like a great example because like you know you're at work you're doing your thing something happens you react and in that reaction mode most people are addressing the symptom what about the culture of amazon created that hey, let's look at root cause is there like a leadership principle that they built that they had one uh, dive deep which was uh, their their leadership principle that uh, directed people to look deeper than just that surface level issue. They also had one to counter that bias for action, 
uh, which is about you solve the problem right now. That's, that's right in front of you. So whenever you have a customer coming to you with a complaint, bias for action feels like the better one to take care of. You want to solve the person's problem right now and let them go on its way. But if you were just always operating that mode, you're never going to actually you know, improve your business. You're not, not going to simplify things for other customers. And uh, you can be over-indexing on bias for action by always going to that mode. So you need to, at a certain point, once that problem solves, switch gears and start doing that deep dive analysis, figure out what's going on. It's, it's interesting how contradictory a lot of all these leadership principles are. And they're, they're like that by design. It's not supposed to be one simple answer for every case. It's, it's very situational. Uh, it's, the context is going to d- 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 drive what needs to be done. What are like the um, tactics a company can use? So we, we've talked about customer obsession. I think a, a lot of that will disseminate into like your team and the people you hire when you hire four customer obsessed people, you obviously ask the right questions and know like, do they even care about, you know, the customer experience, for example, you talk about it, but then when you get to these more nuanced things, like a bias for action and diving deep, what are like tactics uh, that anyone listening to this can use to like get that into their teams, like brains, that I'm gonna have a bias for action and I'm going to, these two contradictory things, bias for action and dive deep. How do you approach like getting that into people's brains so they're really living it and kind of doing what you would do, which is I'm going to solve the problem now, and then I'm going to go like think about, okay, well, what was really the root problem? How do I stop it from ever happening again? Yeah. So you have to have it part of your everyday language. Every day that you're talking, you need to be going back to your leadership principles and using that to explain your decision making. And anytime you're giving somebody feedback on what they should have done differently, always describe it in context of these leadership principles. And over time, that that language and that thinking will just become ingrained. And if somebody's using you know, one leadership principle in the way that you may not have liked to see it, like maybe they're always solving the root cause, or sorry, they're always solving the symptom for a customer, or alternatively, they're not solving the issue for the customer and they're spending all their time analyzing, you know, looking to like what really caused this to try to solve that problem. Meanwhile, the customer is still upset and has an issue. You can say, hey, you know, that was a good example of dive deep, but you didn't have enough bias for action to solve the customer's pain right away. Or alternatively, you know, you're having great bias for action in solving these problems, but you're not taking enough time to slow down and dive deep and really solve that root cause problem. And if you have that, every feedback discussion you have is grounded in these principles, it just becomes easier for people to think about, okay, how do I want to balance this? How do I want to navigate these problems on a day-to-day basis? So it sounds like the part of the underlying answer you kind of gave that I'm hearing, and correct me if I'm wrong, is you need to codify this in a way that everyone can be using the same language. So there's like a uniform way to understand what we're all talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's a, a symptom a lot of mostly corporate, big corporate companies have is they'll come up with these principles or gui- guiding things and they put them up on a wall or you see them during training and you never hear about them again. And they're never discussed. And they're also like often very like hollow, meaningless things like shareholder value. How, how can I as an operator or a person in my day to day really think about shareholder value and that doesn't mean anything. Now, frugality means something or, you know, invent and simplify or improve and simplify. Those mean something, but shareholder value is just like, it's, it's so pie in the sky and ambiguous that I, I can't connect that to what I'm doing right now. So what, what are some of the other, you think, most important leadership principles that were at the core of enabling Amazon's growth? It's customer obsession, number one, obviously. Uh, Invent and simplify was really good, particularly the simplify part. Uh, Sometimes I saw the invention piece as like invention for the sake of invention when simplification could have have been better. That's why at Latchel we changed it to improve and simplify instead of invent and simplify. Uh, Think big was also huge um, for, for Amazon. Like 
you have to make those big bold bets. Uh, deliver results is also big. Like you aren't going to earn trust. Another another uh, one of Amazon's leadership principles. You can't earn trust unless you're delivering results. So one of Amazon's core things is if you can't deliver results, why are you even doing the job? So they they use that as a, a core piece. So I think those few that I just described are part of the core. There's definitely more, but th those are the ones that it's like you absolute must have those. Yeah. Well, let's take those and, and talk about those four for a while. Um, let's start with improve and simplify. I think in this industry, in this space, that one can often be really difficult. There's a lot of like, you know, legacy systems out there that companies are using. There's a lot of just built up knowledge and kind of conventional wisdom around how to do things. How should a property management company approach that improve and simplify when they may have been like, you know, using a lot of the same processes for years and years and have decided this works best? First, I'd like to challenge the notion of using the same processes for way years and years. There, I want to hone in on the definition of that word process itself. I feel like a process is any operation where there's a specific defined set of inputs, a specific defined set of actions that are taken, and then a specific defined set of outputs that come from that process. What normally you see in, in, in small to medium-sized businesses is a way of doing things. It's practices, it's, it's tribal knowledge, or just a, a tradition of doing things a certain way. But if you need somebody else to learn what that way of doing business is, it's very rarely written down. It's usually in everybody's heads, collective heads, and they just get experience for, well, when there's this exception, I need to handle it that way. So I think to answer your question, one of the first steps is you need standard work. You need a consistent way of doing things across every every single task that you have. You can think about your core core tasks in, in property management. It's leasing, you know, uh, turning, turning over units, advertising, getting uh, somebody in on that lease. Is there actually a step-by-step -step process? Is there a checklist that you can do? And if you can at least start with what do we do and I can bring somebody in and train them on what, that do, what we do in order to execute on that, then you can start really improving rapidly. But if you don't know what you do, and by no, I mean actually have it written down and describe all those scenarios. It's really hard to improve because there's no consistency to it. There's no way to actually track, are we, are we improving? Are we changing behaviors or not? Maybe use a kind of line from before you need to codify document and use the same language around your culture. You need to have the same language being used for the, the process, right? The knowledge of going from, you know, point A to point B. How do you actually like, you know, run a, a make ready? What, what is, what's the step-by-step? Step? That you need the common language first and everyone works off the common language, the documented language, make adjustments here, there, so forth. It's so, uh, it, was the, there's really sorry. simple tools too to use for this like you don't need to have you know every single action documented there's a, a book i really like um the checklist manifesto and it's it's just such a simple concept of just simple checklists like uh, pilots use it for takeoff and landing just a checklist for safety and that that saves lives it really Im improves the the safety of our airlines and uh this book is particularly about applying it in the medical field, but it greatly reduces unnecessary deaths in hospitals just by doing simple checklists. Do we have spare blood available? Is this the right patient that I'm about to per do this procedure on? And just have right. like this quick ch back it's and the forth. The left arm or the right arm? <laughs> yeah, it, as simple as that. Are we? Do we know where we're going to operate? Like it's such basic, stupid, simple, but it saves lives and greatly reduces errors. And just having a checklist for your leasing process, your turnover process can greatly improve the quality and speed at which you're able to, to complete these, uh, these issues. So just start with that and then improve on that. And then you can have that continuous improvement mindset. 
was there any kind of like culture principle or leadership principle Amazon had around like that documentation, the documenting of it? So within the operations uh, team, the, the whole department, whether it's ops, transportation, all that, there was a very strong Six Sigma uh, and continuous improvement culture that Amazon created its own called the um, Amazon Customer Excellence System, ASIS, and there's like a whole team of people like going towards that. So it wasn't a company-wide culture, but within each team, you may have like different flavors or views of like what the culture way of operating inside of that, that team is. So that's where we got the closest is that mm. they called it ACES team. It was uh, sure. more like Six Sigma style improvement processes. What's Six Sigma? A Six Sigma. For anyone that doesn't know. Yeah, it's a, um, a, if I even say lean manufacturing, that's not very helpful either, but it's a um, methodology to improve any kind of routine process. Uh, the idea behind Six Sigma is in a manufacturing process, you have errors that are like normally distributed. A uh, normal distribution is that, you know, the, the classic bell curve. And within one standard deviation or a sigma, it's that's like 68% of variation falls in that. And then when you get to two, it's like 95%. Three is like 98 point something. And then six sigma, it's like uh, at a point where it's like three defects per million opportunities. Um, it's... Personally, like my feeling on like Six Sigma is I, I think it's a elitist uh, ivory tower style way because it, it doesn't, it obfuscates information. It's really hard to relate to those, the, that language and those words. And even the fact that I said Six Sigma, like there's so many layers to unpeel. What does that even mean? I think it's better just to say continuous improvement. It's better to say just methodology to make things better. Okay, there we go. It's a methodology to make things better. That's easily understood. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's dig into deliver and measure results. You, that was the one you mentioned right after improve and simplify. I think it's very connected to the way we improve and simplify things. I think it's also very connected to just the idea of continuous improvement that to even improve we need to be measuring what we're doing, deliver something to, you know, move the needle and measure the change, right? Did we actually improve? Can you talk about how Amazon thought about what deliver and measure results meant and how people actually enacted that day to day? So at Amazon, it was just deliver results. And then they separately had dive deep. Mm. Uh, I adapted by combining a bit of those two. I do think we need to still have a separate dive deep. We say dive deep all the time. We don't have it as one of the official leadership principles, but we, we say it, we act it, we live it. Well, these so, are living documents. Yeah, so. We come back to this every uh, couple of months. So. Yeah. yeah, we've made quite a few changes uh, and improved it. But the, the deliver results is, is exactly what it sounds like. It's, you, you say you're going to make an improvement or you're going to have some you know, deadline be met. You need to deliver on it. You need to produce what you say you're going to produce. And then for measuring results, that was more of like Amazon's dive deep side. I felt like it was underemphasized at Amazon personally, and that's why I combined them, is you need to measure what you're doing too. You need to know what is our baseline? How are we performing today? What is our metric that we're looking for? Is it what does this metric actually mean? Do I know what this metric means? And do I know how to affect it? Do I know what I need to change behavior-wise to improve a, a certain metric? Uh, that's where the measure results comes in. And exactly like you suggested, it's really hard to do improvement inside of a company unless you're able to actually measure how you're performing today. Then you make a change and you can measure that change in performance. So I, I might be taking us down like a, a tangent here, but I want to ask, because I think a lot of people will probably be thinking this, it popped into my head, which is like, let's say I'm hiring an assistant, maybe an assistant property manager. Like I'm not giving them all the responsibility in the world. Uh, maybe they're even working part-time, maybe, maybe just 30 hours a week. Do I really need to find someone that meets all these leadership requirements if I want to grow? They obviously don't need to meet all of them. 
But for each job, there's certain ones based on what those responsibilities are that they absolutely must meet. Is that assistant property manager interfacing with customers on your behalf? Very likely. They probably should be customer obsessed. You don't want somebody who's rude. I mean, that this is things that most people would think were probably common sense, but as long as you codify it and say, okay, for this particular job assistant property manager, I need this person to be customer obsessed because they're gonna be taking calls for me. I need them to have a bias for action because when they take those calls, there are gonna be tenant problems that they bring up. Maybe you don't want them to have to focus on measuring results, but you need to have competency, so deliver results is incredibly important. And maybe you don't want this person to be the one who's driving improvement initiatives in your company. So maybe you, you don't need to emphasize you know, continuous improvement or improve and simplify or what, whatever else it, it may be. But there at least are a few core pieces of their job that you want to make sure that they meet. So I'm going to bring us down a, uh, a tactical line here um, because I think uh, thematically sort of what we've been saying that's really important to establishing high growth is building the right team and moving the team in an aligned direction, right? Am it, Amazon didn't become a trillion dollar company because Jeff Bezos did everything, right? Yeah. Jeff Bezos was great at hiring the right people to align things and move things in the right direction. And, and every leader in any business has to do that with their company, right? You're going to, I mean, unless you're a solo entrepreneur, you need to align everyone. Now you're talking about, okay, bring in that assistant. They should meet like a couple of the things on those leadership principles. So let's talk a little bit about hiring. You had mentioned you were a bar raiser. You've done hundreds of interviews. When I interview someone for a position, and I may have those three like or four culture kind of leadership principles picked out that I know this position needs this. How should I interview someone to know that they meet like the bar on those principles? What tactics should I use? My, my favorite way to think about this is the uh, disclaimer for like mutual funds or any stock performance. So with mutual funds and stock performance, there's that disclaimer. It's like past results do not predict future success. But I feel with humans, it's the opposite. Past results absolutely predict future success. So I always love to ask questions about people's past experiences and past performance in those situations. I will come up with a, a set of questions that are very situational. Like, like, tell me about a time that you feel like you went above and beyond for a customer could be one or tell me about a time that you're disappointed you couldn't do everything you wanted to do for a customer um, or tell me about a time where a customer was asking for one thing but as you listen to their problem you realize they probably need something different and anyone who has had like I'd say more than a couple of years of experience, even if you've had less and you've, you've you know, been to school or have had you know, participated in some kind of clubs or extracurricular activity, you have scenarios or situations you can lean on and describe what you actually did in the past. And then your job as the interviewer is to ask lots of follow-ups and deep dive their answers to figure out, well, how much does this answer really hold water? Like the first answer, may be unclear of, well, what did you do versus what did the rest of the team do? Was this your idea that someone else implemented or was it your idea that you also implemented? Did you just watch this happen? And like all that stuff you don't know unless you're going to ask them follow-up questions. And it, it's kind of um, discouraging though when people's answers start falling apart under that scrutiny, but it also it's, prevents you from hiring somebody who's, who's not going to be a good fit. I'll say to you, um, for anyone listening, kind of funny, everyone we've hired that interviewed with Will thought for sure they were not going to be hired. They, they left the interview with Will thinking, wow, I totally bombed that interview. Um, usually that's a sign that like we really liked you. If you feel like you bombed an interview with us, it's probably because we thought you did a great job and just went super deep asking you details and drilling into a question. Um, 
it's hard to ask detail, ask for details when they're not giving you anything. So and they feel like the interview is going well and not asking tons of follow-up questions, it's probably because the answer is not sufficient. I tried a couple times, they just gave surface level answers and move on. It's kind of like my um, just general argument and style or like how I deal with like interpersonal things. When I care about somebody, I'm going to dig in and dive in and, you know, voice my disagreements and, and, and talk. And it's when I've given up on somebody and don't care that it's like, well, you do you and I'll do me and I'll just, you know, live and let live. So, yeah, let's keep going down this, this track on talking about team and the people we bring in. Um, there's like a, you know, common kind of phrase that you hear it a lot in, in Silicon Valley, which is higher, slow, fire fast. And I think by default, when you're hiring based off leadership principles and scrutinizing to know, like, does this person actually fit this? You by default, almost high, you kind of get forced to hire slow. And that is the right way to do it, right? You came from the bar raiser program. You actually were like a third kind of like, a non-interested party in just coming in and saying, do they fit the bar, the, the culture bar? And like, you could make the decision that, no, we're not going to bring them into this team that like, I've never actually worked on. Yep. Right. So like at Amazon, you sort of have that nice balance where the counterbalance where it's hard for me to hire fast because there's so much scrutiny. Maybe as a startup, small business, like, especially if you're kind of the solo person interviewing, you don't have that luxury and you just have to really stick to that criteria and do your best. Um, I mean, do you have any feet before I go on? Do you have any feedback for that kind of solo interviewer? I, I would encourage, if you can, always get a second opinion. I don't trust myself alone to interview and hire somebody. I, I've never done just myself interviewing somebody and let allow myself to be a sole decision maker. There's got to be somebody you trust, like a trusted advisor, a mentor, a colleague, even just a friend who can do you a favor and just you know, do an interview with somebody to give you a second opinion and look at a different angle than you're looking at. One thing that we do a lot at uh, at Latchler, like exclusively is the people interviewing are assigned certain leadership principles that they're going to look for, and they only look for those. Now, through the answers, they might get information or signal or data points about the other ones, but you're assigned a certain set so that each person is looking at a different angle for this candidate, and we're not asking the same questions or looking for the same things. And so that, that's great. Uh, I love that. Um, okay, so you make the hire. We have the second part, which is right, hire slow, then fire fast. Um, can you talk about how we gauge people on these leadership principles once they're part of the company, how we work to improve them, and when we ultimately need to say, we were wrong. We were wrong in making the hire. That was a bad one. How do you know when you're wrong, and what do you do? So. You feel it in your gut really fast when you know that you're wrong. And when you know you're wrong, you, you need to act fast, especially if somebody's coming in and they, they, they were a, a wolf in sheep's clothing, whatever else it may be, like they, yeah. they were able to, you know, interviews shouldn't be a super long process. You, you mostly are looking for red flags and get rid of those red flags, but you're not going to get rid of everybody. There's going to be people who are very skilled at interviewing or skilled at having a certain facade or answering the questions the way that you want, want them to. Um, and then when you get that information, act quickly. Uh, I've heard it described best as uh, when somebody's a bad fit for the company, it's like a cancer. And that cancer, if left unchecked, is going to spread. So you need to just remove that cancer as quickly as possible. So whenever you have that situation, I feel like it's, it's a, don't, don't wait, don't delay, just move quickly on that one. But that's really the exception. Like most people have great intentions. Most people are going to be, are going to fit pretty well overall with your, with your company and are going to want to grow and improve. So it'll actually do something slightly different, which is we have a quarterly review system at Amazon. It was every six months and we, we're a fully remote company, so we try to move even faster and it allows more connection and like better, quicker feedback. 
but again, we use our leadership principles also during those feedback sessions so that people can see how they're performing and get specific feedback along those leadership principles. And if somebody's not performing well, then we put them on a performance improvement plan and talk with them, work with them, and see if they can improve over the next three to six months. Cool. Um, would you recommend quarterly reviews for any size company? I think, uh, well, everyone should be having weekly one-on-ones with everyone that reports to them. And every single one of those one-on-ones, you should be talking about performance. So I highly recommend that. I don't know what is the best situation for every single company. I prefer lateral quarterly makes sense. I think annually is way too slow and way too infrequent, uh, but it's going to depend on the pace of your business and how much time you can can make for those kinds of feedback sessions. Yeah. So <clears throat> Amazon, they have this framework, get the right people in for like what the company's goals were, right? Set that mission, bring the people in to fulfill that mission. And then leave them alone. And then leave them alone, right? Let them scale yeah. that company. Let's talk about how do you leave them alone properly? <laughs> I think especially for like a small business or startup, leave alone is scary. It's really hard. And also it completely depends on the type of role as well. Like there's direct contributor roles that are you know, producing like salespeople. They're, they're leave them alone means a very different thing to your salespeople or to your, your direct operators or your direct property managers than it does for your managers or the people who are coming up with new ideas or new ways to expand your business. Like leave them alone means very different things for, for different uh, people in the company. But you need to give people space to innovate and improve and give, give them room to, to say you know, what needs to be better and what needs to change and then empower them to make those changes and those differences. Uh, at Amazon, my favorite concept was the two pizza team where a two pizza team is essentially the size you, you want every team to be the size that you could feed everyone on the team with two pizzas so you know that that varies widely from like maybe even one no, are they one big pizzas or are they deep dish <laughs> it, it's all open to interpretation <laughs> it's all open to interpretation but you know it, it's a uh so it gives you a lot of degrees of freedom for like how big that team is but it, it gives you a good upper bound you're probably not going to have 20 people on, on a team. But the two pizza team concept is also great for like brand new initiatives at Amazon. Like if you're launching Prime Now, for example, it would be a two pizza team that's in charge of everything. You know, they may beg, borrow, and steal resources from other teams to like get things done. But the people setting the strategy, coming up with the ideas, implementing is that core small team. And they have lots of freedom for how they execute, how they operate. Uh, they will check in with leadership and tell them what's going on and get guidance on maybe bad ideas. But really, if you just open the reins, they're going to probably execute much better. Yeah. So I think a lot of our customers are probably the whole company. A lot of the times is the two pizza team, right? Um, how do you think about parceling out like sometimes the more creative work on growth initiatives, for example, companies that are looking to focus, grow their door count. It might only be the, the owner of the company that the founder that has like the bandwidth to focus on the growth. And then you're potentially leaving that kind of creative vacuum. And how do we improve like the operation? How would you kind of like, work around that and these, you know, a really tight team where you're responsible for a lot more than just these single initiatives. So that, I think that way of thinking about it can be dangerous too, because no, no one's Superman. No one can fly around the world and turn back time and have more hours in the day. And it's possible <laughs> and everyone needs roughly eight hours of sleep. <laughs> you know, so you can't, you can't do everything. So this uh, comes back to frugality and customer obsession. Like you're not a customer obsessed company if you're not profitable. So if you're not profitable, you don't have the room to get the support resources you need to actually make these improvement initiatives happen. So the first thing you have to do is get to that just baseline profitability or 
survive, get beyond just survival mode and actually get into th the ability to thrive. Uh, there was, um, I can't remember the exact course I was taking, but when I was in grad school, there was a, a, a study that found like almost every improvement initiative at a company, at most companies fail. Most fail spectacularly. And they're trying to understand why. Why are all these improvement initiatives failing when all the research and you know, all, the, all the popular um, advice is these improvement initiatives are what you want? And when they dug into it, they found that it's not that all of them fail, it's that actually most fail and then a small segment are incredibly successful. And the difference between those two groups is very few companies are willing to put support resources in place to actually help those improvement initiatives. Because let's say I have a process that I'm running today. I run it a certain way every single day. And now I have an idea to make it better. Well, while I have that idea and to implement it, there might be some friction for the team. It's harder to, to change the way your brain thinks about this problem. Or I might have questions or I'm confused about how I'm supposed to operate. Well, do you have anyone to talk to that's going to help you get over that, that learning curve and that hump? And if you don't put that person in place, that support to help, then the improvement initiative is going to fail and it's going to revert back to the old way of doing things because that's easier. So you have to have profitability in place or a willingness to spend that money on the support resources. Otherwise, those improvement initiatives will never take hold. I think another way to maybe look at it is, you know, your, your entire company needs to be able to move in that same direction. Like if you're, if you're putting focus in on growth, everyone has to be aligned with working on that growth and supporting that growth. And maybe a good way to think about it for like the smaller team, smaller company that can kind of only maybe focus on one thing at a time is to think about it in sprints, which is a lot of how we actually organize our technology efforts. We set up a sprint where we focus for a short period, very intensely on moving the needle on one thing. Uh, unless we have like lots of really small things and we haven't really defined the real big thing to move for that, you know, week or two weeks or even sometimes quarter. Even then it's a specific theme or a specific set of metrics. Even if there's tons of initiatives that are supporting it, it's all supporting the same end goal. That's a great point. So maybe one way for the smaller company, a lot of like our customers, for example, that don't have you know 50 employees or even like 20 employees, they may only have eight folks on the team is to do it in that the kind of like the, that thematic way for the next three months, it's really focused on growth. Everyone's supporting that, right? I mean, obviously you, you do everything you have to do to keep the business running and then everything else goes into growth. And then maybe that next quarter you say, wow, we've kind of neglected a little bit on that was operational improvements. Cool. We're going to be like totally aligned now operational improvement. I'm curious if, to me, that seems like a, a naturally just a way to grow that makes sense and keep everyone aligned. Curious if you'd agree with that. Second, I, I want to know, like, if you know, in the early days of Amazon, how did they kind of manage that before they had like, you know, 100 plus folks where they could divvy it up a little bit easier? So even today at Amazon, they do manage it that same way. I mean, you have lots of different teams that are like focusing on all kinds of different directions, but like even within say a single facility, there is a monthly theme. Today we are focused, or this month we are focused on quality and they even have bonus structure and initiatives so that, you know, if quality goes up, everybody is going to get a bonus at the end of the month. And then the next month it's productivity and what practices and improvements can we put in place to improve productivity? And as long as things aren't declining while you're focusing on the next thing, then, then you have a, a scalable, robust operation. I think it's absolutely the right thing to do. And I think that that theme that to set what we're going to work on and improve is really encouraging and helps the, the team rally and see, hey, they're working on X. I'm seeing improvements on X and I feel good because I'm, you know, the company's delivering on what they say that they're going to do. It's not just empty words. And then broadcast it, yeah. <laughs> broadcast that to everybody. Okay, so we talked about those core leadership principles that align everybody and like that vision, the way to think about it. It's, it's like the glasses that everyone's going to use to see the world, your leadership principles. 
We talked about how to hire the right people with those leadership principles, how to keep the team focused on those, grow the team, give people the space to work on scaling and moving your company forward. Topped it off here with a quick talk on how to align everyone in these initiatives, these like sprints. Is there anything else you want to add before we wrap up, Will? I want to make sure that it's, all this is tied back to being a high growth company. It's just like any journey of no matter what distance, it all begins with a single step. And you're going to complete that journey just one foot after the other. You don't have to make these gigantic leaps forward in order to have a high growth business. All you have to do is keep walking forward. Love it. If you want to see a company that has put this high growth into practice, join our session next week. We're actually interviewing a customer of Latchell's, Peter McKenzie from Rincon Property Management. They've, they're part of NARPUM. They've been a Latchell customer, I think, like two or more years when we were itty-bitty startup. Um, they've seen the whole growth path here at Latchell. They're going to talk about the things they've done to go from zero to over 100 units. Um, I'm really looking forward to talking to him. He's going to have a lot to say about growth too. So join us next week to uh, watch us talk to Peter. Thanks for joining, everybody. Thanks, Thank Will. You.